funny story, uh, a couple of months ago, those of you that were present probably heard me bellyache about the number of people that are SVP and then don't show up. And uh, this month I decided to get a little aggressive with the under-ordering of food because we always get a little burnt on that. So today I think that we have uh, gone over our RSVP, so thank you very much everybody for showing up. This is actually awesome. My apologies for the uh, uh, kale lunch. Very good for you. But anyway, I'm going to get uh, off the podium here just about as quickly as I can and let you uh, uh, get on with the feature presentation over here from Pacificat. But as always, I have a few things to, uh, to announce. And since there are a lot of people in the room, some faces are new. So introductions are in order. My name is David DeArts. I am the uh, current president of the board of the Seattle Revit User Group. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'll get you through a, a, a couple of things here. And uh, we'll get going. So today's presentation is brought to us by Pacificat, which uh, is, uh, we're very happy to have Pacificat as an executive sponsor this year. This is their first year as executive sponsor and their second presentation this year. Uh, they did another one uh, last as a premier partner and we're very lucky to have them. Uh, so we'll have uh, their presentation here in just a second, uh, all about family creation, best practices, tips, tricks. Uh, as many of you in the audience probably know, creating families in Revit is, uh, there's a lot of nuances to it. It's uh, relatively complicated, or it can be relatively complicated. But also, as I'm sure you know, is vital. You can do very little in Revit if you don't uh, create some really good families or have access to really good families. So with so many people in the room, again, there's some new faces, and I'd love to see a show of hands as to who in the room uh, is uh, an architect or works for an architecture firm. All right, so that's a pretty good number. How about engineers, whether it be MEP, structural? Pretty good number. How about contractors, subcontractors? Good, I always like to see that number going up, and it seems to from uh, meeting to meeting. But uh, today we have a, a fairly uh, good majority of architects in the room, which makes sense uh, given the topic of family creation. Not that creating families is not critical for the engineering side, but. Uh, Probably most of uh, you out there that are needing to create families are on the architectural side. So we really look forward to that. Tom Tripp from Pacificat is going to have that in just a second. Just have a, a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, just a big thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, you know, we've got a, a number of executive partners that have been with us over the years. And like I mentioned, Pacificat is new this year. Um, and they really do the bulk of the uh, fundraising, if you will, for this. Uh, you know, we. Uh, really endeavor to always maintain the membership to the Seattle Revit User Group to be free of charge to you. Uh, so, you know, the executive partners are uh, really the key to that. And uh, no less important to that, of course, is the premier partners and the associate partners, the rest of the folks, some of you in this room uh, that, uh, that are, have been backers of CRUG for a long time. We're very lucky. Also, like to just give a quick shout out to my fellow board members. Uh, you know, we put this uh, show uh, for you and uh, uh, try to do a good job, try to make it interesting and, uh, and relevant to you. And so, thank you very much to everybody that's up on this list. You guys know who you are, um, and it's uh, it's a pretty nice way of staying involved in the community. And it's certainly our pleasure to put these uh, shows on for you. Stick around towards the end uh, of the show. I've got, a, I've got an envelope with everybody who are SVP and the name is in here and we've got a couple of uh, Amazon gift cards to give away. So don't leave too early. Hang out until the end. Right after the Q&A, we'll take care of that. Uh, and uh, with that, um, I'd like to uh, bring Bill Inman of uh, Pacificat up and I think he's going to share a little bit about Pacificat. You know, they're new to the area and I'm sure you've got plenty to say and I'll let uh, Tom take it directly from here. Uh, after that, and you won't hear any more from me until the end. So thank you very much for being with us, and on to Pacific Act. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to give you a few uh, words about Pacific Ad, let you know who Pacific Ad is and what we do. Uh, thanks for having us uh, sponsor your, your lunch today. We're an executive uh, partner with CRUG. And uh, we're, we're happy to sponsor um, such a large user group. Uh, we sponsor user groups in other cities as well, and uh, this is the largest one. I can tell you, uh, my name is Bill Inman. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Pacific Cat. I moved my family here to Seattle 
Um, April 1st, it was official, we moved in. And um, I can say that I've learned that it never ra rains in Seattle. Just uh, kind of surprised by that. Uh, Tim Douglas is visiting us here. Uh, he's with Pacific Cat. He's an account executive uh, with us, and he's going to be managing some of our accounts here in Seattle. He also maintains an office in Boise. Our, our office is on the, in the AGC building on South Lake Union. Uh, Tom Tripp will be presenting the feature presentation today. So let me uh, go right into telling you a little bit about Pacific Cat. We're an Autodesk Gold partner. We've been in business for uh, 26 years, uh, over 24 years now with Autodesk, uh, a local regional staff of 35 people. Our headquarters is in Spokane. Uh, we have offices in uh, Boise, Bozeman, Montana, and now Seattle. Uh, we're a Washington State business, uh, and we have comprehensive offerings, and of course now we've got the Seattle office in addition to the other three. Uh, we are changing the game. Uh, we're, we're evolved. We're more than just an Autodesk reseller. So we do more than just selling you uh, boxes of software. We're committed to our customers' success. Uh, we specialize in integrating um, BIM, VDC, and CAD with project, data, and lifecycle management. Uh, we have on-call CAD and IT expertise. When it comes to IT systems, uh, we all know that uh, 3D design, BIM, uh, virtual design and construction, uh, these things stress workstations, they stress uh, networks, they stress the servers. Uh, there's lots of barriers to uh, collaborating inside an enterprise and outside the enterprise with uh, other project stakeholders. Those barriers include uh, storage issues, access issues, uh, data transfer issues, and obviously uh, just being able to collaborate. Pacific CAD does have the solutions. Uh, we offer not just Autodesk, but best-in-class technologies. Uh, we're a Microsoft partner, uh, Bluebeam partner, um, PaxZone, Riverbed and Panzer are IT uh, type solutions, uh, BIM 360, uh, fabrication, product data management, um, product lifecycle management or building lifecycle management, uh, computer data manufacturing, Force automation for substation design, uh, Microsoft Azure, and Amazon Web Services for helping you move your, your data to the cloud. Not just your archive data, but also your working files if you'd like to work from the cloud. Our specializations include um, AEC, construction, uh, BIM and VDC, uh, civil and infrastructure, advanced structures, um, uh, Autodesk has got a new product called Advanced Steel. We specialize in that. Uh, product design and manufacturing, network optimization, and uh, data and lifecycle management. We have uh, certified uh, uh, training and support for our customers. Uh, public classes, custom training classes on site at your facilities. Live classroom um, training as well as online training. We have training centers in four cities and we have eight Autodesk certified application engineers uh, that range uh, each of the verticals, whether it's civil infrastructure, uh, Revit, uh, manufacturing product design. Um, we've been training since 1987. So in short, Pacific Cat is, uh, we're hoping to change the game. Uh, we have a holistic business model uh, um, centered on exceptional expertise in the technologies that drive your business. We provide world-class customer service, and our motto is building high-trust relationships, delivering value, and empowering our clients' success. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Tom Tripp. Our, he's our VP of Technical Services and our AEC Application Specialist. Thank you. Afternoon. So Revit families, who's created them? All right, good turnout. Who's created really advanced parametric families where you can adjust them linearly? All right, so for the medium out there, uh, for beginner and intermediate, so kind of where we're gonna shoot from, um, I'm gonna talk about the steps created for family creation as well as some best practices, things to follow. In starting, there are three different types of Revit families. You have your in-place families. Those are, or excuse me, system families. 
Those system families are what are developed inside of the template file. As you load your project, you'll start a template. Typically, you'll see them in stairs, you'll see them in walls, as well as other miscellaneous like text and dimensions. You also have in-place families. Now, in-place families are typically a custom one-off type design. I'll show you an example of that here in a few minutes. The, the in-place families are something that you are creating specifically for that project. It's a certain piece of equipment, it's a certain piece of furniture that you would use. And then the last one is loadable families. That's one that's, that we are familiar with. We're using the family tool to load libraries in there. Your doors, your windows, your text, or excuse me, your tags, that kind of information. Now, as a side note, of course, I have to plug myself a little bit here. I'm currently doing a three-part webinar series regarding Revit families. They are found on our website through the link you see listed here. By the way, we are recording this. You can always pull it in again later. But I'm doing the third and final part dealing with parametric families on this Friday. So if you want to check it out, you can register for it. As we talk about the system families, as I said, those are loaded as a default inside of the template file. When you're bringing that information from the template, those are listed as there. They're typically not an editable type of object, meaning you can't load those in from the library. I'm sure you've all seen the type properties window before. If it gives you the name system family, it's dedicated to the template file. There's also no load option, but there's an alternative if you need it from one project to the next. And that's an option through what's called the transfer project standards. That's found in your manage tab of the ribbon. You can grab that information, transfer it from one open project to a next open project and have it listed in there. Another alternative you might be familiar with is the copy and paste option. It's always available. Okay. The next one is your in-place families. In my rendered image here, we see a nice reception desk or somewhat nice reception desk. I kind of did it on the fly. But this reception desk is specific for this design and this design only for this one project that we're working on. This isn't a family that I can load out of a library. Sure, I may have found something on Revit City or maybe even Autodesk, but more than likely, it's something I need to create custom. When you create custom families, you're creating them natively inside of the project file. There's a lot of limitations to doing it that way. You're dealing with a large canvas area as opposed to a small, minute area you would normally work with. In dealing with in-place families, you're also increasing the footprint size of your project every time you copy and paste that. So if this were a piece of equipment that you need to be in, have in different rooms or different floors, I would highly recommend creating a family first and loading that in. The footprint size will be a lot smaller, unnecessarily bloating the file, essentially. And then the last one we're familiar with, of course, is our loadable families. As we see, we have standard freestanding families, which is the desk and the chair we see here. It typically requires no hosted element. Technically, it's the level that it's hosted, but regardless. And then we see actual hosted elements, such as our doors, which are physically hosted into a wall. That would work the same thing for a light fixture for a ceiling or even an um, electrical outlet switch. From there, as you get ready to create families, there's a lot of little things to consider not only during, but before as well. The first thing is keep your modeling to a minimum. The objects themselves, yes, you could model up a piece of equipment that has all the knobs and buttons as they would be in the real world, but at what advantage is that going to be? It's just gonna take up a lot of visual resources for the object and it's gonna take up a lot of actual footprint size for the object as well, not to mention the amount of time you spend on that. There's no sense in having a 10 megabyte file when realistically you could do it with about one megabyte in footprint size. Now, if there's any manufacturers in here that create Revit families, I'm gonna apologize for this next comment, but manufacturers tend to overmodel their objects as they are in the real world, which is great, but it tends to be a little bit useless for us in the actual Revit production world. In the construction documentation, we really just need the representation of the objects, how they're displayed in plan view, elevation section, and maybe an isometric view. If it were rendered, if it were a high presentation slideshow we're gonna to show to a client, then yeah, I might wanna model that up differently, which would be an entirely separate family all in together. Now, past the modeling, what you wanna think about is how are we going to use these families? What are we gonna use these families for and how are they going to be displayed? So is it for documentation? Is it for sectioning? Is it for detailing? Is it gonna be for scheduling? How do we intend on using this family? The next thing is make the naming intuitive. You want users to be able to identify what that object is. If I say single hinged, what do you immediately think of? Probably think of a door, right? 
If I say 36 by 84, you're thinking now of the size of the door. 36 inches wide, 84 inches tall. Hopefully I said 84 inches that time. So you have varying sizes of it. You want to keep your naming convention intuitive enough for others to be able to identify it. The next is your symbolic lines. Symbolic lines are annotation geometry. They're basically 2D lines that you can associate to the faces of your objects, your modeling geometry. This enhances the detail of those objects. It gives it more, basically, exposure to what you see of that object. If it's a bunch of vent lines in the side of a piece of air handler equipment, you can do that with lines as opposed to modeling those fins out. You can also use masking regions to help control a lot of that information as well. As you are creating the families, the one thing you always want to take note of, especially if it's a sizable family, meaning that it can have multiple sizes associated to it, is that you want to flex that family. You want to flex those parameters to make sure that if I adjust the width, there isn't a conflict with the length. If I adjust the height, there's no conflict with the linear array of the objects that are there. The last thing you want to do is have everything created, all said and done, inserted into the project, change the size or create a new size and have this constrainment error that you now have to reverse engineer all the way back to something very simple. Now, I said avoid in-place families. Avoid in-place families for multiple placement scenarios. One-off scenarios like the reception desk I showed in the rendering, perfect. If you're using it for a piece of equipment, a light fixture or a VAV box, not something I would recommend. And lastly, as I stated in the first one, keep your modeling to a minimum. No need to overmodel. You might be you know, wanting to do it, but try to avoid it at, if at all costs. Give me one second, I'm gonna grab a drink of water. All right, as you get ready to create your families, there's a certain order that is recommended for these. You wanna start out with your reference planes. Your reference planes are essentially the backbone of your object, it's like your skeletal structure. If you apply clothing or skin to that skeletal structure and the skeletal structure moves, the skin and the clothing are going to follow it. Making parameters so that they are flexible. Adding dimensionable values. When I say width and height and length, you know what it's going to adjust. Adjusting those to the parameters moves those, or excuse me, to the reference planes, moves those reference planes. From there, after you've created your reference planes, you've associated your parameters, now it's time to associate your extrusions, your solid geometry, to those parameters. Therefore, if you flex the reference plane, the extrusion's going to follow it. And the extrusions can be of multiple shapes, and I'll show you how those are set up. Lastly, after you've created the overall geometry, it's now time to add detailing. Be it if it's gonna be for plan view, section view, or whatever view representation you want. Following that, so you can add additional parameters potentially for scheduling. This is still kind of an avenue a lot of people haven't really explored. I'll show you how kind of a quick way of doing that and how it can be accomplished. And then lastly, you would create all of your additional types. For this example, I'm gonna keep it very simple. I'm just gonna do a nice little coffee table that is adjustable in three different sizes. 24 by 48, a 30 by 48 or 60, and then a 30 by 60 inch. So we create several different types. As we go through this process, you'll kind of see how each one of these reacts to the next. With that, let me jump over to Revit. Now, like I said, this is going to be recorded, so there's gonna be a lot of steps and features in here that I'm going to cover, so you can always review this at a later time. As I'm in Revit, I'm gonna open up a quick little project here. We see our floor plan view like we would anything else. We see that there are already some existing families listed in here. I wanna create a nice little coffee table for this area here. It's not something that I found online. It's not something that I was able to get from a manufacturer. It's something that I have to create for myself. We're gonna have a custom piece made from the client down the road. So in doing so, we're gonna go to our application menu. Inside of the application menu, you're gonna have your new and your family. From the family, it's gonna load all of the Revit family types. Those are RFT extensions. Because this is all-inclusive Revit, dealing with architecture, structural, and MEP, you're gonna see all of the families that you can create. Each one of these has its own set of characteristics, be it if it's a baluster for a railing, if it's gonna be an individual door, if it's a plumbing fixture, if it's a lighting fixture, or even structural or windows. It'll have its own set of parameters predefined. If you're not sure where to begin, there's a good starting point, and that's the generic model side of things. Generic model, there's a whole bunch of different ones that are available. 
you'll see a lot of them say based. It means that there are hosted type of families, be it if it's a ceiling, a floor, or a wall. If you're not sure where to go from here, keep it simple and start with a generic model. You can always work your way up. Having chose the ger generic model, it will drop us into the interface of family creation. Now, what I'm gonna do is switch out my views here real quick. Show you a quick couple of scenarios here. I currently have, window tile, zoom off. I currently have four views open. We have a plan view, an isometric view, a front elevation, and a left elevation view. Inside of this view, you see these green dash lines. These are what's called reference planes. These are what helps you create adjustable types of families, meaning sizable, different sizes. Now, the overall interface is relatively straightforward. It has the same kind of thing we've had in the past. It has your, it has your Create tab with all of the different panels inside of it, which is dealing with properties, things to consider here, your normal properties palette. There is a family type dealing with uh, identifiers for your parameters as well as the types of families that are available. There's also a family categories. Now keep in mind, I chose the generic model category when I started. If eventually this is going to become a door or if this is gonna become a piece of fixture or equipment, then I would change that category accordingly. Therefore, I can turn it off and on in the actual project as opposed to leaving it to a generic model. There are also tools dealing with forms every time. There are tools dealing with your forms. It's gonna deal with extrusions, blends, revolves, and sweeps. There's also void forms, which have the exact same tools. Those are solids that subtract out of the actual solid objects, so they're void objects. You have modeling tools where you can add an additional modeling detail. This information is going to be displayed in all views, plan, elevation, section, et cetera. There are also tools to control connectors for the engineering folks that are in here. You can create different connectors for electrical, plumbing, HVAC, cable trays, et cetera. So you can make your objects intelligent, be it if it's the voltage information for electrical lighting fixture or if it's an HVAC duct value. We also have some controls for reference planes, which I'll explain, and also some work plane scenarios. This is the main tab you primarily work with while creating families. And I'm gonna tell you some shortcuts as we go through this as well. In my floor plan view, as I stated, we do have these reference planes, these green lines. If they're important, they're usually named. Hopefully the text shows up there that it is the center left right reference plane. It also has a little pin mark in it as well, telling me that it's push pinned into place, it's not allowed to move. There is also a horizontal plane. That is the reference plane for front and back. That is also pinned into place. If you look at the properties palette, you'll notice that there's a little checkbox that says defines origin. Both of those have those set. That defines the origin of the insertion point of the family, which is now the next thing you should think about. When I'm inserting my family, what am I gonna, how am I gonna insert it? Based off the back left corner, the center of it, the front of it, where, where's my insertion point going to be? As I create those things that you wanna consider is just that. If I were to create an extrusion from the back left corner, it means the insertion point is going to be at the back left corner. And as I create this, the objects themselves are going to grow out from a specific direction. Now maybe this is just a simple piece of furniture like I'm creating. I want it to grow from the center, both on the width and both on the length. In this case, I would center out the object and leave it at that. But again, we have to have constraints that control what that width is going to be, what the length is gonna be, or even what the height's going to be. Each one of these reference planes is essentially a single line. If tilted up on edge, it now becomes a face that which you draw on, a basically a plane that you can draw on. You can select those planes and associate the objects as needed. And I'll show you a prime example of that as we get into the solid extrusion portion. Now back in the create, I'm gonna create just a very simplistic one-off type of object. This is a specific manufacturing part that I needed to create. So using just the simple extrusion tool, I'm sure everybody has seen the sketch mode where everything half tones out and you end up drawing with magenta lines typically. That panel that's specifically set for it is your draw and your work plane panel. 
In the draw panel, you have several different tools, lines, arcs, rectangles, circles, et cetera. We'll keep it simple and do a rectangle, and then I'm gonna haphazardly place it around the center point of my object. While in the creation of it, we can go to our options bar and control the depth. We can also go into the properties and control the depth as well, where it's starting and where it's ending point is for the actual height of the object. After I have created it and I have finished it, we can see that object in all views. Now, keep in mind that there wasn't any constraints, there wasn't any dimensions associated to this sketch. Therefore, after the fact, I can grip edit it to however I want, whatever size that I want it to be. This object, as it sits in the family creation, is still completely editable. I can change its size, I can change its shape as needed. But if I were to load this into the project, Go to select it, you'll notice those grips are gone. There is no parameters in the properties that allow me to change the width, width, length, or height. There is no edit type values that allow me to change the length, width, or height. These are all basically a one-off type of design. So again, if you have a specific component that you need to have designed that you don't want edited, prime example, go into the family editor, create it as needed with your appropriate dimensions. Now, what if you do need flexibility, though? Going back into that family editor, we're gonna take this object and I'm gonna get rid of it. I'm gonna start to draw my own information, but I need this to be flexible. I need to have multiple sizes. So I need to create reference planes that are eventually going to house the constraints for those. To establish your reference planes is like drawing a construction line, an intelligent construction line that allows for other options associated to it. In your Create tab of the ribbon, underneath your datum panel is the reference plane tool. For those of you who like to type in stuff, it's RP for the shortcut. As I draw my reference planes, it's not necessary which direction you go, top to bottom, left to right. There's a plane on either side that you can flip, especially if you add in your connectors for your MEP world. You can always flip those as needed. But as I've created my reference planes, I can eventually create them in a horizontal and vertical fashion. I can do several things with these. I can associate dimensions. And as we all know, a multiple chained for one string dimension has the ability to do equal constraints. If it's equal constraints, I can now throw an overall dimension on it. And if I edit one of those reference planes to suit whatever need I need, that works, I'll get an equal dimension overall. And that's from the center point. Now, if this were from the back left corner, I would have only added one reference plane with no equal constraints to it, because it's going in a specific direction, it's growing in a specific direction. Repeating that process, again, using the equal constraints, the overall dimensionable length, and adding a reference to get it close to where I want it to be, we now have a simple two foot by four foot perimeter. Now these perimeters eventually are gonna need parameters. These parameters are eventually gonna be inside my project, inside the families that I can edit. Going into my properties panel, underneath the family types in the ribbon, we can start to add these family editable features. Currently, everybody's already seen the identity data. These are the parameters that say manufacturing, the model number, cost, whatever else is there. We've also seen, probably like with doors and windows, are the varying sizes. This is how they created those sizes, and this is how you'll create yours. Going into the add parameter button, you have two choices to start with. A family parameter which cannot be tagged, nor can it be scheduled. So if this information needs to show up in a tag somewhere, or somewhere down in the project to schedule, you can't use this for it. If you did, you'd wanna use a shared parameter, which I'll show you at the very end of this. Using just a stand, standard family parameter, you normally wanna give it a name, something that's intuitive that makes sense for everybody to look at and go, oh, they wanna adjust the width of my object. Please hold me back on uh, laughter for I make a mess, spelling mistake here. The type and instance, is this global to the actual object or the individualized per instance of that object inside of the project? For this case, I wanted to do a global setting. If I change it to type A, all types A change, as opposed to individual types. The discipline, primarily for any kind of dimensionable, numerical, or textual information, you're gonna use the discipline called common. If you are going to be specific and use flow values, or voltage values, or friction values, you wanna choose from the appropriate sub-disciplines, HVAC, plumbing, piping, electrical, et cetera. For this, we'll leave it at common. The types of parameters for common are relatively straightforward. Text is usually alphanumeric. Integers dealing with whole numbers. You have numbers, which are decimal values, so on and so forth. 
As a side note, if you had a visibility parameter, an object you wanted to turn on and off, you would use that as the yes, no parameter. For my example, we're all be choosing, choosing is going to be a length value dealing with feet and fractional inches. As I've added this information, I see that it shows up. Currently the default value is zero because it isn't tied to anything. I don't want it tied to anything as of yet. And as I click OK, I now decide that this dimension is gonna house that parameter. You'll see in my options bar, there's a new label tool. This label tool allows me to associate that parameter. It now says for the dimensional value width equals two feet. And what's cool about this parameter is that if I make a change to it, it pan slightly here so you can see this all in one shot. If I were to edit this value to, let's say three feet and hit apply, it moves the reference planes and it moves them from the center out because of the constraints that I already set up. Having done that, I now have the potential start of a flexible type of object. Now, one method of creating those labels is going through the family types. If I've already created the dimensions, it's gonna make a lot more sense to select the dimension, skip the step of creating them and go right into the options and add it dynamically. You'll see that in this list, common and length for the type parameter are already set. You cannot change this after the fact. I'm really left with instances of it and the category or group where it's going to be at. One last little one I'm gonna do is for the front view, the front elevation. Again, RP for the reference plane. Associate a quick dimension to it. Make that parameter known. So this will be a height parameter. And at that point, I really don't have anything in the, the height view, but I do wanna test it to see that if I flex that value, it's going to affect the overall object itself. So again, going into my type properties, adjusting the value to let's say one foot five or one foot six inches and hit apply, that flexes that parameter, that reference plane, which is perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. Back into my floor plan, now that I have the overall skeletal structure, it's time to clothe it, it's time to put some stuff on it and attach it to those. Because if I flex those reference planes by the parameters, the information associated to it should automatically move as well. We've all dealt with solids at one point or another, this is just, again, a simple extrusion. The tools listed for and under the draw panel are pretty straightforward. Here's a little caveat that's kind of frustrating, especially if you only use the line tool. There are exceptions when you have to use it. But with the line tool, if I want to associate it and have it lock to the constraints of that reference plane, I immediately see the padlocks, which is promising, until I move my mouse. Then it goes away. So the only way to correct that at this point is to do one of two things, move the magenta line off the line, bring it back to it and lock it, or use the align tool. This is rectangular in shape. I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna use a rectangle tool. Going from intersection point to intersection point, I now have all my padlocks. I'm constraining the sketch of that extrusion to the reference planes that I've created that are flexible. Having accomplished that and finishing out the sketch, I should now have a nice little 3D box. That 3D box should be adjustable now. If I take my width or my length or my values and adjust them, we should get that to work. Now in a normal instance of Revit, 2015 and up, they finally changed the option of uh, the order of your parameters. So as you create them, if you want width to be your first one, you can move those up. If I want the height to be the last one, I move it down. Move it down, not up. And then I can make my adjustments. I'm gonna go two feet, apply it, changes, perfect, I'm good and happy so far. Looks like everything's changing without any issue. And lastly, we'll do a height, four inches. Nobody caught that, okay. I would have eventually caught it, I think. And then our lastly, our height. Perfect, I have all the information I want. Now, what eventually I'm going to do is I'm going to create the thicknesses of the legs. I'm gonna make them square just for this example. I'm also gonna control the tabletop thickness as well, but I'm gonna use a formula that allows me to control that. So we're gonna kind of take advanced formulas in here. While I'm in this list, we'll add another parameter. I'm just gonna call it simply enough legs to make sure I have the right parameters grouping and discipline established. I'll add another parameter called uh, just TBL thickness. This is one of those features that I'm not too worried about Keep intuitive because it's gonna be tied to another parameter. I'm gonna move these down so that they're kind of at the bottom out of the way. If this was something that I didn't want it uh, to be at a specific location, 
I want it maybe grouped to something else like table thickness, I could always go in and modify it and choose the group that it's associated to. In this case, I'm gonna list it as other because this is something for our group, I don't want them to be actively thinking they can edit. After I've created those values, it's time to add more reference planes to have a little bit more intelligence to those. Adding in the reference planes, we're gonna make sure that they are dimensions and use the same parameters for all of those values. Now, the legs, in this case, I'm keeping it really simple, they're gonna be at the very edge. But as I add my dimensions, I'm gonna select the dimension and say associate it to that leg parameter. It's now listed. Any other dimensions that I add at this point are gonna immediately follow suit. So the first one that's added is pretty much the primary. If I change this value, all of them will change that eventually. Now I do need my two verticals here, so we'll add those quickly. And then I'll select both dimensions at the same time, associate that leg parameter, and they both change to four inches. Again, because I've made some significant changes, I've added a couple of new parameters and some new reference planes, I definitely wanna flex this out to make sure that there's no conflicts. First thing that we do is we associate the legs. I see that those adjust. I'm gonna adjust the width. Off to the side here. I'm gonna adjust the width to make sure that as I adjust this value, it doesn't affect the legs in any way. As I do, it looks like everything's staying where it needs to be. It's always two inches off the edge, which is good. You'll notice that I'm always kind of going back to a specific value. I'm in my mind knowing what the default size of this coffee table is going to be, what typical placement 51% of the time is going to be, and I always revert back to that value. Therefore, if I, when I create it and I insert it into the project for the first time, that's the one it remembers, the one it goes to. Now, in this next step, I need to extract information out of that solid to make it hollow. Right now, it's just a big box. So going through the creates, underneath your void forms, we're gonna create a void extrusion. The void extrusion likes to have work planes to work off of. Right now, I have two that are named. The horizontal line and the vertical line, front, back, and left, right. What I don't have is a vertical or a front face plane or a left, right, or top plane. If I were to go ahead and set a work plane based off of an existing name, you'll see that center, left, right, and center, front, back are the only ones that are available. For right now, I'm gonna leave it at the front back. It's going to prompt me to change that view, which means I'll have to change the extrusion of it. Now, another method of creating these is also going through, yes, is to also go through and rename these reference planes. By selecting the reference plane, it has its own name. This isn't something I'm too worried about as far as the naming convention, so I'm gonna keep it simple, just an acronym, FE for front edge. I'll do the same thing for the left edge as well. And you'll notice that as I've named these, the information is then immediately displayed on the line itself, LE for left edge. For my front view, I'm gonna tile these here real quick. From my plan view and from my front view, we're gonna create that information now. Immediately seen in my front view, I noticed that I didn't create the extrusion to that top plane, correct? Now there's a couple of different ways to do this. One would be to use the align tool. The other one is to just grip edit it to the reference plane, which will automatically bring out a constraint for me. Now I wanna create that solid extrusion form again. So using the current work plane, which if it's not already set, I wanna make sure it's set, and that's going to be to the front edge I will create just the simple top. Now, I'm going to, li going to limit this temporarily. I only have three constraint points. The top is not. As I finish this out, I want you to look at the plan view. Notice how it started at that edge and goes back, but it only goes back so far. These are parameters that I can control. Now, I could grip edit it. That's a different, a different option that I can use, or a better practice, would be to associate that distance, the same distance that already exists, which is my length parameter. Having selected that void, you'll notice that we have the extrusion start and end, but I also have these little add parameter options now. I can add the parameter of length, and as soon as I add length and accept that, my void goes all the way through it, which means if I change the length of the table, that void is gonna follow the length as well. 
Now I did mention that if I were to change my overall height because I did not constrain that last value to it, the table thickness is always gonna stay a certain distance. I need that to change, I want it to be dynamic. So to accomplish that, I'm gonna need to go into the front elevation view and associate another reference plane. I'm gonna create my dimension for it. And then I already have a parameter created, so I'm gonna say that is going to be the table thickness. And then I'm going to use my uh, extrusion to lock and constrain it all in one click. Now if I adjust my table thickness, my overall object, make it one inch, my overall object should change as well, which it does. I do have another extrusion to make for the sides of it. This one I'm going to do intentionally wrong so you can see how you can fix it if need be. Give me a little tip or a trick here. Going into my left elevation view, creating the normal extrusion that I would, avoid extrusion, using the rectangle option. Picking the appropriate points, constraining the appropriate objects, and finishing these out, you'll see that from an isometric view, it only worked on half of it. If I were to select that void, you'll see that it only goes to half of that area. I wanna make sure that it starts at the right reference plane and ends at the right reference plane. So to do that, you can edit your work plane after the fact, you can fix it. I'm gonna associate it to the left edge reference plane. The only thing that's left is to go through and adjust the overall width of it for the parameter. I now have what starts to look like a coffee table. Very simplistic in nature, I know, but it's the function, not the form, right? Okay, now that we have that, I wanna create a scenario where if I add it or adjust the legs, I want the table thickness to follow a suitable size, something that lo looks relatively proportionate. To do that, we'll get into formula parameters. In our dialog window, you have the values which are hard-coded. You can change those at any given time, but what if we want it to follow a certain value? What if we want to say that half the leg distance plus a half inch is always going to be our table thickness? So regardless of what the legs are, it's always going to follow that formula. You want to make sure that when you create these that you're using the parameter names in case sensitivity. So it's capital L-E-G-S for legs. It's going to be divided by two. Now, realistically, nothing changes, and I don't know if the screen shows it very much, but it half-toned the actual value for the table thickness. It isn't until I visually change this do we see the actual change take place for the table thickness. Now, I want to take this a bit further, and I want to add a different type of formula, one that says, do this mathematical equation first, and when you're done, I want you to automatically add a half inch to it regardless of what I say. So if we change our leg thickness to, let's say, six inches, Divide that by two, you got three inches, automatically add your half inch of thickness. We now have a three and a half inch table thickness for it. And of course, because I was just changing some parameters, I'm gonna apply it. I should see that the legs have changed and the table thickness has changed. As you're adding and modifying and flexing your parameters, you wanna make sure that everything is still working. As trivial or as obsolete as it might be for another object, you always wanna make sure that is the case. Now that we have the necessary information for it, Time to add a little bit of detail to this. What is it gonna look like when I'm in a plan view? What is it gonna look like when it's in the section view? Well, for the most part, this is relatively straightforward, so really the only thing I can do is add a little bit of detail to the top of it. It might have a different set of in inset on the top of the table, it might have a pattern on there that I wanna have. Now, I'm gonna keep it very simple here. The first thing that I need to do is make sure that I have an appropriate reference plane. That's this top plane. I haven't given it a name yet, so I can never select from it. I will choose it by calling it top. Going into my reference plane, or my floor plan reference view, I'm now gonna add some information. Keep in mind that this is geometry that we'll see in plan view. Model geometry takes a lot longer to generate in a normal view than regular annotative geometry, lines, arcs, and circles. So you always wanna keep it as simple. Therefore, that modeling comment I made earlier about keeping it simple makes more important sense. I don't wanna see my model geometry while I'm in a plan view. If I select it, you have options to control your visibility settings. When do you see these? There's a default that says, regardless, we're always gonna see it in a 3D view. But we also have options to show in plan view, left, right, or front, back elevation views. And also, at what detail can we see these in? If I uncheck that floor plan and reflected ceiling plan, I'm not gonna see it in any one of those. Looking down on it or looking up at it, I won't see it. Now, 
as I go through this, I'm gonna add some annotation to the top of it. This is a symbolic line. This is just simple 2D geometry. Just like before when we created our extrusion, we're gonna use the option to constrain it to the edges of my parameters, what essentially is my top or my width and my length values. I'm also gonna create another inset as well that controls it to the inside, which is gonna be the inlet of my different type of wood, let's say. Now, after I have the symbolic lines, I need to think about when are we displaying symbolic lines. Any annotation you create in Revit is always view specific. If you create it in floor plan, elevation, section, and whatnot. Same thing goes for symbolic lines. We have visibility settings that we can control those in. I'm in a plan view, it's only gonna be visible ever in floor plan view. But at what detail am I going to see this in? Coarse, medium, fine, I wanna see it in coarse. Or I don't wanna see it in coarse, I wanna see it in medium, fine. Now one last little thing that I'm going to catch that I realized, but I'm not gonna show you until after the fact, is that I didn't put it on an appropriate reference plane. And we won't see that until we go to an isometric view. Now the isometric view, again, that's a 3D object, right? I just put two-dimensional on information on top of it. You're not gonna see it in this view. The only way that I'd be able to see this is if I physically placed it inside of the project. So I'm gonna go ahead and overwrite. And I'm gonna place. So this is when I now see it in plan view. My current detail level is set to core or medium. If I change that to coarse, the inset lines go away. I've just changed visually the way things look, adding more or less detail at one click. Now, going back in and editing this family, I realized, you know, it makes a little bit more sense if I had that detail while in an isometric view as well. Unfortunately, symbolic lines won't show up in an isometric view. The only thing that will is going to be a model line. Now let's take a, a, a door handle, for example, on a door. Should I model that up? I could, but when am I really gonna see that? An elevation view, right? Maybe a section view? It's easier to do with symbolic lines than it is with model geometry. Plus you're looking at a bigger footprint for the actual object. This is one of those that I do need to have that extra level of detail. So taking my symbolic lines, we're gonna convert those over to the appropriate tool. It gives me a notification that I'm converting over and they've now been converted. When in an isometric view, I see that those lines are there, but they're on the floor. They should have been associated to the reference plane that I needed, which was called top. Again, a simple little edit work plane after the fact fixes that. There we have it. Change in the level of detail, according to those model lines, is the same thing as anything else. I can turn it off for course, and say, don't show up. Now, it might be hard to see, but those are half toned out. It's a visual indicator that those aren't physically there in a coarse detailed view. So at this point, I've created a lot of model geometry. I've created the overall shape. I've created parameters that allow it to flex back and forth. I've added detail to it to give it a little bit more visual enhancement. The last little bit is to throw in some materials to make it look photorealistic if need be, to add in some scheduled parameters that I need to have, and also make the individual types. So as we start to round this out, I'm gonna use my um, options to start with to change the material of my extrusion. Keeping it very simple, go with wood oak all the way through. I'm gonna go into my family parameters and I'm gonna add a new parameter. Now before when we did this, we used the family parameter, but these can't be scheduled. The only way we can schedule them is to use a shared parameter. This is something that typically the CAD manager is gonna wanna set up or somebody that's really knows what's going on in regards to families, and here's the reason why. This is a text file that it's going to create. These are set up based, based off of groups. So you have your own text file that's such created. Your groups typically are your categories, doors, windows, walls, et cetera. Each one of these parameters that you're creating is going to be specific to the need that it is created for. So in this case, I just put SKE for a simple serial number. But if I needed to change that after I've created it, and I go into the properties of it, look what I have to edit. Nothing. Immediately after creating it, I can't edit it. Just to give you this example, doing it live, I'm gonna say that it's test, common as this one, and I forgot that it was supposed to be text, but I left it at length. I hit okay, oops, I made that mistake. I'll go to properties. It's locked out. This is a one-time deal. And you cannot edit this in actual notepad because there's a hard-coded value in here. Hopefully Autodesk will fix this, not that I said that. It's on their radar. Now, as far as the shared parameters, this is something I want to show for the object that's there. 
So selecting that shared parameter, associating it to the object, and then telling it what category it should belong in, I'm gonna say the identity data category. It now shows up in that list. So now I can create a number for it. Now, I needed three different sizes, 24 by 48, 30 by 48, and a 30 by 60 type of table. At this point, my next step is to create the individual types. Remember I said, keep these naming conventions intuitive? That's what we're going to do. I can easily see that this size is 24 by 48. These values that are here should reflect that. Also, in this case, my SQ number is gonna reflect that as well. The next size, 30 inch by 48 inch. I'm going to not only change the size here, but I'm also going to apply it to make sure that when I do enter this information, it's changing the model information as well, which I see that it does. And the last little one is going to be a 30 by 60 inch. And again, with a different SQ number. I see that it's changed. Now, I always wanna go back to the default family type that I want inserted most typically, which is going to be that 24 by 48. The last thing I'm going to do before I put this into a project is save it. Obviously, I should have been saving all along, but it's a very short topic. Not only am I going to save it, but I'm also gonna add the category to what it belongs to, therefore I can turn off that category at any given time. That's gonna be my furniture information that's there. There are also tools regarding if it's work plane based, if it's hosted, et cetera, that you can explore based off of other families. Once I have that, I will save it as just simply enough. Coffee table. One last load into project, placing it off to the side. I'm gonna get rid of that family. Selecting the object, how does it show up? Shows up with a family name called coffee table. What sizes are available for it? All the sizes that I told it to create. Plus, what's nice about this because there are parameters that I can edit, I could also create additional sizes by selecting it, editing the type, duplicating it as needed, giving it an appropriate name, and being able to change that information. Remember that category that I called as the table thickness? It's there at the bottom. It's kind of unrelative to where I'm currently at in my screen. Now for the schedule parameters that I put in there, shared parameters, that's gonna be part of the schedule itself. Given where I'm at in the current project and what I've done to my SKU, I need to remove it temporarily and re-add that parameter. This is something that normally I wouldn't have to do. Choosing the furniture, SKU, all the way out. Information is now updated and scheduled. If I had a tag associated with this, I could tag it and have that information relative as well. Okay, with that, do one last little window tile. Oh, tons of views. One last little window tile with my schedule. And just to show that it is in fact going to change, changing the overall table from one size to the next should in fact change my SKU number, which it does. So everything is good to go with where it is. Now, having said that, you're in place families. I've already created the table, the tabletop already. I'm not gonna worry about saving when closing my coffee table. Just one second, I'm open on the reception view. I'm gonna see this kind of live. Now, I'm not gonna physically go through the editing portions of it because you'll see how it's all gonna tie in together. But this tabletop, as it's created, all it is is just an extrusion. And that extrusion, when I edit it in place, becomes its own value, becomes its own editable option. Now, what did we have when we were in the families? We had a small little confined area, a nice little neat area that we could work in. When you do in-place families, you're dealing with the entire project as your canvas working in a little tiny area. It's doable, but it's a little bit of a challenge. All right, with that, Conclusions. So where do we want to be with our families? We definitely want to plan ahead. We want to think about how they're going to be used. What are they going to be used for and what is the purpose of creating them? You want to look at re using reference planes, especially if you plan on using multiple sizes. Reference planes are essentially, as I said, that skeletal structure of the objects that are there. Modeling, shouldn't have to say it, but modeling, keep it to a minimum. 
Use it symbolic lines instead. Use your model lines instead to help define that information. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you associate all your parameters, be it if they're actual dimensionable parametric parameters or if they're schedulable type of parameters. With that, first of all, I want to thank David, obviously, for having this present. David, I know, does a lot of work here. Take a second here to maybe give him a round of applause. It's, it's obviously an effort to herd everything together and have it all work, so. At any rate, with that, questions? David? So the, the question or the comment is the, how to best practice when you have multiple sizes of multiple objects inside of it. For example, if we were to use this coffee table and, and use wood legs versus tube legs and the various sizes that would go with those. The legs themselves, I wouldn't have modeled the way that I did. I would have created a separate family that had all the various types of those. I would have not only had wooden legs, but I've also used tube legs as well. I would have loaded those families into the project, created a separate visibility parameter that says when I'm in a tube leg, these are turned on, and when I'm in a wood leg, these are turned on to affect that. And then, based off of the parameters inside of it, control which sizes are associated to which type of table. A larger length table might switch automatically from a, a wood leg to more of a steel tube leg. It gives you a little bit more flexibility in that case. Does that help address? Correct, yeah, nesting from basically pulling it out of the Revit library already, maybe in the structural or just the normal structural uh, folder into your current family and then adding it as there. So basically it's a model inside of another model or a family inside of another family listed in there. Gentlemen, so the question is, could you edit those nested family's dimensions? If you set the parameters accordingly, yes, you would. Um, it ends up being, the remember when I had the add parameter for when I said take that void and make that width length of value the same? That would be a parameter that you've added from the first nest into the second one and add that parameter associated to it. So yes, and that could carry on through the actual project as well. Gentleman blue shirt. So light fixture modeling and how, it's, how to get past that or how to do it. The best thing to do, there are certain families you don't want to start out with. A generic model is probably the prime example for starting out with. You want to use an actual lighting fixture family. It has the default features for any of the IES as well, the IES, the lighting value file as well as the light fixture source that's associated to it. As far as modeling it up, using the same principles that I explained can create it. You, depending on your shape and what you're going for, a simple trough or light, it's pretty straightforward, but something a little bit more unique with a valued shape might be a profile or a rotated edge to create that. So best practices for materials, be it if it's in the family or in actual projects. It really depends on the, the user and the goal for it. Um, when you have it set in the project itself, you allow any user to edit it at any given time. If it's set in the family, then you're limiting that use, meaning that realistically you could take that family back to a, a, a higher level of CAD management that says we don't edit the families. When you go into the edit family, that's somebody else's position or, or job. Um, you can tie those two together with a parameter if you need be. So from the family, you add the parameter that says edit material or add material that carries through the project, then they can, the individual user could edit it. So using voids and using multiple voids inside of a project, what kind of issues or can there be issues? There can be. The more voids that you add to it, the more complex and the more calculations it has to think about when you start modeling that information, which can cause issues. So again, for this example, I did it the way I did it just to show the example. I primarily would have created a separate leg family and brought it in, but given time and content, I had to take the lesser of two evils, unfortunately. Um, pending the object and material associated to it, I could have used the join tool after it's in there. So basically a nested family into my tabletop. So the question is whether or not you can see the voids while in the, pro in the project, or in the, um, I, wanna say, I wanna say it's a yes, but I'm not 100% on that. So is there a schedule that can read everything inside of Revit? One schedule? I'm not aware of that out of the box. I'm not saying that it, it couldn't be done via programming, but out of the box, I'm not familiar with that. Does anybody else know if that's a an true answer? I was thinking that, but I didn't know if it would cover all the categories as the thing. Right, there's, there's, well, there's certain parameters it doesn't pick up as well in those as well. Can you do what calls, I'm sorry? Math books? Um, the, the formula information that you have in there is pretty simplistic in nature as far as the language that it associates. I don't believe so. 
not without any kind of API programming. I, I, will, make, I will make sure I use that. So the, the initial question for those of you that didn't hear, and I apologize, was could you use math books inside of your formulas for if-then statements or any kind of that variance? Um, out of the box defaults, more than likely not with s simplistic nature. Um, now, that brought us to the next one is couldn't you just use Dynamo? Absolutely, you could use Dynamo for that, for those type of expressions for that kind of information. Um, there's various practices for them. Um, pretty much the, the order that I had had on my list for Cape parameters, schedules, et cetera, is a pretty kind of global, general, what everybody typically follows. There's variants for what your families you're creating and how you're creating them as far as the steps for creating those, but it's pretty, do step A, B, C, et cetera. Depends on what you're going for, correct. The biggest part is I always storybook it out, figure out what I'm going to do first, what's my end result, that's the goal that I'm going for, how do I want to get there and what stages do I want to create that information. Absolutely, so the question, yes, absolutely. So in, in 2015 and 16, they have now tool tips for each one of those parameters. So as you're looking at the parameter, if it says SKU, that may not make sense to most people, but you can highlight over and it says, this is the serial number we're gonna associate to the model, put it in, blah, blah, blah. Um, yes and no. Uh, you try not wanna jump too many releases as you go from family to family. Um, so is there any conflicts from going from one release to the next was the question. So jumping too many releases can, can potentially have issues. It depends on the complexity of it. Um, from the latest releases, I have, I've upgraded files that were in 2008, so four or five releases ago and didn't have any issues. Of course, I have to knock on wood because I will now. So when a family gets too big, turn it, convert it from a, a, a family file to a project file. If you have a family file that's getting that large, too much of a, I would look, um, it's basically lightening the load for it. So you, you could essentially save that as its own project file. A, probably a practice I wouldn't recommend for it. I would suggest going into that family file either start cutting out what you don't need or don't have to see in it or recreating it with a lighter load. Okay, so the, whether or not you use families, then create groups, insert them in there, or create the groups and insert them in there. So family group, either or, if I kind of understand it. Um, it. I guess it depends on the object itself and the parameters are gonna be editable inside of it. Um, because once it is a group, you're limited to just the group information. To go in and re-edit it, you need to open up the group and edit it from there. So. It, I would say either or would probably be all right, again, depending on the object and what parameters you're trying to edit for it. Questions in the back? So yes, no parameters, whether or not when you insert them for the, for the family itself. Um, I see the yes, no being used quite a bit for basically a, an on-off scenario, but I've seen it also for scheduling in the mechanical world. Um, fire damper, does it, is it on, is it installed on, is it installed off, or installed open, installed closed? That way it could be scheduled out. But primarily it's a visibility type of setting that I normally see. So it's, do we see it? Yes, do we not see it? No. So re have they resolved the, the different types of hosts going from, let's say, a, a wall to a ceiling to a floor or non-hosted? There's actually tips and tricks for that as well. Um, there's not necessarily a, a quick fix, pick here, pick there, and it's now a hosted object or a non-hosted object. But there's ways of inserting those families that are hosted and convert them over to a non-hosted or vice versa for that kind of family. Autodesk doesn't have a simple click and pick to create those from a non-hosted to a hosted or vice versa. Yeah, there's, even though there is the hosted option in the family categories when you create it, not always the case. Um, how you can normally tell is the family itself as it's created, if it has a backdrop object associated to it, basically a work plane, that gives you a clear indication of it. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Russ Slud. Yeah, that's good. Thank you.